Right. There you go. Um, right. I'm now going to share the screen again, Robert, and then uh, it's all it's all yours. Just let me know when you wish to change a slide. Okay. Thank you. Um, good evening, everybody. Um, delighted to be welcomed back uh, after my impassioned view of um, the 9th of June last uh, in, in 2020, when I look back. And um, we were looking at a very uncertain future. Uh, I think all the crystal balls are broken. And uh, there were some very nice messages of concern um, reaching out. So I thank you for those. That was very, very kind indeed. Um, so Gordon, if you'd like to just change slide, please. Thank you. Robert, just for those that didn't hear you on 9th of June, are you going to explain what your business does? Uh, sorry, remiss of me. Uh, well, I, well, I think I'll lead in with the, um, the production. Yes, I will. Um, so if, if you change the slide, Gordon, and um, we can show the... This is my uh, manufacturing facility in Harlow in Essex, Junction 7 of the M11. That's why we're located here, because we've got London and the home county surrounded. Um, with uh, food service uh, bacon products. Um, so into the catering, hotel, sandwich bars, uh, basically any, anybody who's got a mound of bacon going all day long like a golf club, uh, we want to be involved with. Uh, but regrettably, this was a picture um, from April 20. Uh, we'd had a big expansion in uh, 2015. And this was a factory that was operating um, at 5% capacity. So 95% empty at the time, which was why I was rather concerned. Um, if you could do the slide, Gordon, please. There's a bit more depth later on. So this just gave uh, a brief example of the industrial nature of our manufacturing capabilities. Um, it's basically intake manufacturing part processing and then that's uh, pallets of product there's a ton of bacon on each pallet there uh, with a different configuration for a different type of client customer uh, for national distribution so that was um, what it should look like uh, regrettably it was it was in um, not not such good shape at the time so I can enlighten if we can change the slide again Gordon please um, this is what uh, just looking back at dates, so forgive me if the dates are slightly um, erroneous, but as far as I'm concerned, we got Brexit uh, eventually, early 20. Uh, transition period uh, began, um, so it was all, all in front of us. We didn't know what was coming. We're right in the, the middle of the, the pandemic as it was. If you haven't forgotten, it was COVID-19, not Omicron and not monkeypox. Um, so again, these things keep on coming, uh, but we're just dealing with things as they present themselves. So it was a slow build back from the um, April closure. Um, very sadly, uh, is that slide four? Sorry, uh, yeah. Uh, so very sadly, uh, we lot had 22 redundancies in that period um, with a slow build back. Uh, dealt with the weekly furlough rules. If you forget, we had uh, news conferences on Monday evenings at five o'clock, telling you what happened, uh, you know, why they couldn't have done it on Friday evening so you could plan the following week, I don't know. Uh, Sybil's loans we were involved in, um, working from home uh, with, with colleagues, adapting as best they could, maybe adapting to Zoom calls better than I have done. Uh, but there was a blanket ban on no expenditure within the business, uh, certainly no cost increases and no investment during that time. And uh, coming to all the other reason, I've, it will come contextualised when I put my holiday down there. I needed a much earned rest before Christmas. Um, so left the country still with um, the deal pending, uh, tariffs pending. Um, and it, it was just just a nightmare. We needed um, two weeks worth of meat in the January to ensure clients maintain supply in case the border shut. Uh, in fact, that 
soon got sorted over that weekend. We ended up with twice as much stock as we then needed. Uh, with on the next slide, we'll show you uh, another lockdown three from the 6th of January with no customers again. So it was a pretty, pretty nightmarish period again. Um, so if we wouldn't mind doing slide, Gordon, please, the five, this will just show you uh, as we did previously, uh, the weekly volatility of our input prices. Um, for you that can read the graph, um, the red line that goes through the center of the data is the average over the uh, nine, 10 year period. So there are some cyclical cycles and they'll come more apparent as I explain that as I go through. Um, but we started off um, in 2020, which is the purple line, um, moving up um, to sort of week 13, uh, which was uh, the end of March, which was the start of um, the sort of COVID lockdowns in 20. Uh, followed normal cycles to be about week 30 and then uh, sort of picked up and dropped off to a lower level um, at year end 49. So it, it sort of followed the, the trend curve um, and, and people were optimistic that it was going to write itself quite quickly. But obviously in farming circles, the, the farmer is feeding pigs um, on a sort of five and a half, six month cycle. So when trade stops, the animals are still fattening for market effectively. And, um, they, you know, they're still walking in and the meat is still coming, which created some difficulties um, in the following year where there was too much um, meat in the system for the ongoing COVID demand. Um, I mean, in beef, for example, the four quarter meat was selling, which is a third of the value of a carcass for um, more economy cuts like burgers and processed mints and people re retreating to value items. But the two thirds value, which is the hind quarter, which is all the restaurant cuts. So this would be fillet steak, your sirloin steaks, your top sides, or your carvery meats. Um, that was going in the freezer. So things were in, in that year were just getting a bit out of kilter uh, with what was actually being purchased, the animals coming to market, and there was just some significant adjustment um, that was going to, going to be coming. Um, so if we can just, without changing slide, if you just look at the 21 uh, graph, which is the blue squares, we, we had a dip after Christmas till be about week nine. Normal cycles again rose um, till mid-year. And then from about week 26, which is a normal dip in the market, a very benign, flat, long, stable pricing. Um, basically, there was too much meat in the system. Um, they didn't want to drop the price any further because they wouldn't have sold any more meat. Um, it was well below the long term average, but it gave stability in an uncertain time. Um, but for us, this created some quite good um, conditions for um, some good margin activity. Um, if we wouldn't mind doing the slide now, Gordon, please, to slide six. So then um, this is what happened. Uh, 2021, um, we had the lockdown uh, three. Um, which was early in the year. Um, I was still on my holiday in Portugal and there was a state of calamity in Portugal, as they called it, which shut everything down till um, end of March. Uh, we had return flights booked for February. They were cancelled by Ryanair. And then really bizarrely had a foot injury, which took a number of weeks to um, rehabilitate from. And um, we, were, we were locked down basically in Portugal and didn't get back to the 21st of May, which was quite a nice sabbatical after 40 years of, of effort and a, and a COVID period. Um, but what I, what I realized when I got back is that the, uh, the business wasn't in great shape. 
and we really had to look at um, where we we're going in the future again still still in lockdowns and the threat of redundancies and certainly it wasn't until the end of the year about September when furlough was phased out and the uh, some of the employment issues then uh, manifested themselves later in the year um, but we, we believed in ourselves and we needed to rebuild the business. We saw that business was coming back slowly. So we looked outside of our normal sort of internal recruitment and we had three hires from outside the business, all still with me today and very productive, nice people uh, with a great attitude. And, um, you know, we, 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 we wanted to invest in the future. So a, a sea change, a, a change of mindset, if you like. Uh, we, I thought that the key to this was labour. You know, people worked very hard for me in sort of quite harsh conditions. So we increased the uh, rates of pay uh, to a minimum of uh, nine pa- uh, ten pounds. Sorry, um, I think the rate now has come up in April twenty two to nine pound fifty. So we're well above that. Um, but then started to invest in machinery for ongoing production in July and August. And we had a little uh, bit of a employment issue, let's say that, with um, people getting a bit tired, not, not wanting to do the work. And we, we just thought the key is higher wage economy. So we upped the wages again, which effectively was a 9.5% increase on the previous rates, um, high salary levels at senior level that we've ever paid. Uh, We didn't suffer driver shortages um, and all our goods were able to keep moving as we built back and um, continue to invest in 21 in process machinery um, to assist the people and then just when we you know we thought we were getting in great shape we had this opportunity to do this magnificent work for um a a pub chain a national pub chain um that we're still enjoying today six months on um 30 ton a week which is probably one of the biggest orders we've ever taken but it was on top of um probably operating about 75 percent at the back of 21 uh, and putting this big contract win on top, which has kept us very, very busy. Uh, And it it really did um, crystallize the fact that, um, you know, the investment we've made in our people, uh, their families post COVID and our business, um, we picked up this work where other people were failing uh, that hadn't done these things. And, and left themselves exposed to labour shortages, manufacturing problems and supply chain issues. So we, we, our business thinking at that time, we had to trust our position in the market, trade would come back. Uh, we were all staffed up with best rates of pay. And then we had this contract win, which was absolutely magnificent, I must say. Um, Gordon, if you wouldn't mind changing slide. So give you a background on pig prices. So while all this day-to-day trading in the UK is going on, uh, we have the the German pig price. So again, if we relate that to the black line, which is 2020, uh, up to about week 11, 12, which was a two euro per kilo high, COVID times again, the pig price fell for the European farmer all the way through the year Um, and and up to about week 37, autumn lows um, going into a below average year with a low point week 35, 37, going into the autumnal Christmas period, which was pretty much much unheard of really uh, at those levels And, and unsustainable, I would say. Um, But 2021 then uh, opens up with a quite benign uh, period, the first eight weeks of the year till end of February. There's a great deal of 
clearing stock from Christmas, overruns, people cutting back with flexitarianism, uh, January, you know, no drinking in January, not going out, hospitality sector, not busy. So it's a flat period anyway. Um, and then we get we get an increase, normal cycles, but certainly below the, the blue and black dotted line, which is European pig price average, um, to a low price again, back where it was the year before. So two year, two periods on the trot, um, 20 and 21, very harsh on the farm, a European farmer, um, but the manufacturer uh, found it a bit easier because we, we were building back and, and we ensured profitability. So we were in a great place, um, but, uh, actually, right, yeah, just sorry. Um, so peak price is 21, stable lows um, carried on. So if we can just go to 2022 and then we may come back again on the next slide, Gordon, please. So while all this is going on, we've got the European Union, our lovely politics, raving, Brexit, whatever you want to call it. And um, we have IPAFs, which is the import of products of animal food and feed system, which is a pre-notification uh, of uh, to government of the movement of animal products, particularly for us. Uh, this was thought to interrupt European supplies and all the threats of I can't remember what the name was on the M20 down in M2 down in Kent. Uh, stack, operation stack, uh, back with all the lorries being held at port. And we, we suffered very little interruption from our European colleagues. They were as motivated to get this working uh, as well as we were. They'd enjoyed our business for 40 years and, and wanted to make it work, along with the haulier that was trapped in the middle, uh, and make it work too. But it's actually been seamless. I think there was one incident where um, the importing Hawley's main uh, server was bombarded with 60,000 e spam emails over a weekend. Sounds very much like a Russian uh, cyber attack, which crashed their system. And at, um, I think it was Harridge, the Boulder Falls computer wouldn't talk to the HMRC computer. So one of the computers was saying goods were fit to leave the port. The other government computer was saying no. And regrettably, the haulier, because their server had crashed, couldn't intervene in either way. So we had a minor difficulty, but it wasn't about the big regulation about importing goods, uh, slightly more localized than that. And that's how we started the year. Um, and we committed very early on, um, we were hearing all about inflation coming, price, fuel prices. Uh, we committed to a 185 kVA solar installation, um, which uh, has gone very smoothly. Um, it's on the roof and um, it, I'll come to that later. But um, I don't know whether people were aware, but there were war games being played in Belarus the previous year uh, with the massing of, massing of troops. Uh, these, was, these were due to end on the 20th of February and they did end the games and then we had the real war. So that started on the 24th of February. That's the most attributed date to when the Russians actually crossed the Ukrainian border. Um, but there was an American think tank, uh, think tank sorry, uh, um, that played 30 virtual war games um, and NATO lost all 30. So I don't know what that says for the future, um, but I think, you know, getting, um, what are we on, Moldova now, um, going to become part of, part of NATO, so better not get too political about this. Um, but the consequences uh, will come to later on. Um, so still building back uh, in the business, dealing with conflict all over, 
we have a third party audit every year uh, from uh, an external uh, auditing company. It used to be called British Retail Consortium. Um, so it was the big retail supermarkets that pulled this together. So we were operating at a retail standard, even though we're in the food service market. Um, but this has now been spun off into another acronym, BRCGS which is now Brand Reputational Compliance Global Standards. And in this time of building back, we've achieved a double A grade, uh, which is the highest we could have got, uh, two minor non-conformances. One was a typo uh, that had been copied over 13 years that no previous auditor has spotted. And against you know, what we do here, it was the toughest set of criteria yet for food production. And we got our best result ever, which was absolutely amazing. Oh, we're still smiling actually. Um, so that was great, uh, great news. Um, we've had draft figures to the end of April 22. And the irony of this is we've just turned in our best year of figures to date uh, on our draft accounts. Um, being very prudent about the work we're taking on, payments, margin, um, turnover is not fully recovered uh, to pre-COVID levels, um, but we've ensured that margins are there. Um, we knew that uh, increases in prices were coming. We were forecasting 9% and, and have built some of those in early, um, just not to pass those on to the customers immediately, really. Um, just uh, so yeah, that was year end to April. Um, bit of stats: uh, Standard Poor Growth Index has uh, collapsed in May um, to February 2021 lockdown levels of pessimism um, in the in the area of business activity. So it's oh, I think it's already stopped. People say to me, "Are you busy?" And I would say that I've been flat out since September uh, 21, but May, it's just eased off a bit. So I think in this contraction is coming. It's sort of here, uh, it's not reported yet. Any data by its very nature is historical. Uh, so it's not live, uh, but we're, we are feeling this is just slightly eased off a bit. Um, so the speed of slow, the slowdown actually has been the fourth largest on record. Um, and um, inflation at a 40 year high coming. So um, if it's not here already. So these, these are what we've got to deal with next. Um, but we're very pleased while well, we're looking at um, our electricity contracts and energy levels. That our solar installation went live at the start of May. And uh, some of our early data from a couple of days ago, we're producing when the sun came out 200, just short of, well, I think it was just slightly over today, 200 kilowatts of power off of our roof. A cloud went over and it dropped down to 13. So it's, it's not constant. There are periods, um, but this investment in the future in our sustainability, as much as our cost base, um, will produce 22% of our daily electricity at peak. Um, but we are hoping that when we're outside of production hours uh, at the weekend, this will run our refrigeration over the weekend uh, at minimal cost, right, which will be great. So what have we got coming next? Uh, are we, yeah, we're still talking around this. Uh, double digit inflation seems to be on the cards. Um, it's hard to imagine people have still have money in the bank so they can cope with it. I don't know what's around the corner. That's a bit like the, um, the 250 million metric ton of grain in the ports in silos in um, Odessa, which is a third of the annual harvest um still in silos from last year in fact there's still some on a boat in the harbour from pre-war and it just can't move 
So this year's harvest in Ukraine should come out um, end of June, start of July. They're quite early for some reason. I think it's that beautiful soil that makes them the bread basket of, of, of Europe. Um, it's it's going to be a real structural problem. And, you know, they're talking about food poverty and famine in countries that don't have robust uh, GDP. Um, you know, they, they've got to solve this. I mean, I say one bomb on that port from Russia uh, and that's, that's, you know, fire, just burn it and, and take the facility out. It, it's, a, it's, it's probably one of the biggest economic strikes they could make. So let's hope Putin's not listening. Um, pig feed uh, as a consequence has gone up 800%. So although um, maybe it's a good time to flip back Gordon to the previous chart, if we may, on the pig prices, um, we can see that if we look at 2022, uh, where the arrow is, if we go back to week seven, eight, so that's again the normal cycle, but this is just when war broke out in Ukraine. It's just got this really inflationary rise. We've never seen this rise before uh, from its lowest of, of 1.2 euros per kilo back up to just short of two euros. Um, and they were forecasting 230 because the farmers in a position now where because of the previous low in the autumn, they weren't putting down pigs, weaners, fatteners for future trade. So a six month cycle from say week 39 sounds like 26 weeks. Uh, yeah, sounds like about now really, doesn't it? Um, so they were forecasting now increased prices, but then you've got the increase in pig feed because of European grain backup. So the farmer is not going to get back the money for his pigs that he's been piling in over the last six months. So from now forward, it looks extremely onerous. So I tried to bring some more, more uh, optimistic news with my local uh, performance. But, the, you know, the, these issues ongoing are going to really come out with some atrocious stories, I'm afraid. So um, food inflation, we've spoken about um, 10 percent. Um, I think the Bank of England said it's apocalyptic food pricing. Um, I don't know what the future looks like. It looks bright for us and, and save recession, which could be coming. Technical recessions, two negative quarters. Um, I don't know whether it's going to technically trigger, but it's certainly going to feel like it. And, and our feel good factor is an easier barometer uh, with red top uh, newspapers, uh, you know, forecasting doom. Uh, that's probably quicker than the actual economic data, which is actually quite robust. Banks are still lending this time round, and, and there's a great deal of support. But it's whether this turns into um, a standard of living crisis um, it, created by food shortages, uh, fuel inflation, ongoing war, and then we won't get into politics of the EU, um, but there was a stat out this week which said about the UK, there's three, oh, sorry, 1.3 million job vacancies and the unemployment is at a level of 1.3 million. That doesn't mean the people that are unemployed can fill the vacancies. They're probably a totally different skill level, but that's the first time that's happened that there's more, I, I, I mean, some people are unemployable and will remain so through to, you know, ill health or inability. Um, but we've got more jobs than there are people to take them up at the moment, which is encouraging. But this was a labour uh, issue created by by Brexit and, and people returning home. Um, so um, if we could just go back to slide eight, Gordon, please. So the back end of the year. Um, for us, the, the onward challenges um, 
we've got, we were supposed to have at the start of July health certificates to accompany the IPATHs uh, notification in uh, July. Um, I think the government doesn't really know what it's doing, doesn't know what the Brexit meant for free trade. So they've taken the ball by the horns and just pushed it back, kicked the can down the road to the end of 2023 um, because they don't know how to deal with it at the moment. But if they give themselves 18 months, they may actually be able to design, uh, get a bit of software in to make it as easy as the iPads has been uh, with QR readers and uh, digital recognition so that lorry drivers don't have to get out of lorries, you know, to show pieces of paperwork. We should be far more sophisticated than in the 21st century anyway. Um, but the problems for us remain of, of triangular trade. And this is um, because we don't use UK pork, we import our pork. We have EU origin material that comes out of the union to Britain now. And we want to be slicing that and, and supplying our previous customer base in Ireland, for example. And under the, uh, the free trade agreement, the EU have blocked this and they don't like this triangular trade. So it's a bit of protectionism from them is they want to keep EU product in the EU for EU citizens, i.e. Southern Ireland. Um, and this is where we come to the UK politics again of Ireland, where there is a border, hard border, soft border, is it in the sea, is it on land, have we not got one? And actually the governance of that, and whether we actually evoke Article 16 and... You know, the early advice was that it was illegal. The government have taken advice. It is, this is exactly the facility for taking unilateral action if they invoke this. I mean, the, the Europeans are not going to like it and they'll take other measures with all, all uh, measures available to them to counter it. Um, but a very, very sticky area ongoing. Um, and unfortunately, we've lost business that we've just had to leave alone until there's some sort of, uh, of more stable resolution. Um, but on just on the final slide, uh, Gordon, don't know what the future holds uh, after 2022, but we just think we've got to keep our commercial heads down. We're in a very robust position. We've been very prudent. Um, if we keep the same values that we've had in integrity, um, it served us well for 40 years, that should get us through. So um, with um, the FT forecasting the end of 30 years of globalisation, um, who knows what is next? I'm sorry I can't be more enlightening on that fact. But thank you very much for inviting me to speak again, and if I can help answering any questions i will try my best thanks very much robert it's quite a uh, challenging subject this whole food inflation and i think the question mark covers it definitely covers farming and right. it's be part of the sector um we hear i heard is it waitrose bailed out pig farmers in the uk recently yeah yeah um and we've we're the minister is a mr eustace is a minister for agriculture, food, and fisheries, and uh, his surname almost covers describes him. Well, He's, I think the parochial name is Mister Useless, isn't it? That's right. Yes. <laughs> right. Any questions, Colin? Yeah, I was just wondering if if there's a chance that you might at some point source your pork from the UK, or whether you think that's um, Unlikely. No, we, we, we are Red Tractor approved. We, we, we would love to get all our pork from the UK. Um, but there, there isn't the herd. I don't know what the UK numbers are. I'm a little bit away from that now. Um, but we are, we're only about 40% self-sufficient in pork in the UK anyway. About 50 as we've been growing uh, post-Brexit. 
Um, but certainly the, the lovely bacon that you might enjoy at home from Waitrose, um, you know, has a premium and um, regrettably food service food is, is bought on price. And, um, you know, these pigs are in the herd on the continent, have been for 40 or 50 years. And, and you know, this, the, stru the structure is there to supply the UK with our food needs. Mm -hmm. So we're selling about one, one tonne of British product a week to about 249 tonne of imported product. Mm -hmm. And the, we've tried it with Metropolitan Police, um, British Airways, um, can't remember the other companies, but basically the, the tonne we do goes into schools contracts um, as specified a red tractor product. Um, I mean, the economies of that is our audit fee for red tractor, which is on top of our current audit regime, is probably greater than our profitability on that sector. Uh, but we do it as a service line to keep the work for the catering butcher that buys all our other products. Um, you know, some of the problems with it in the UK would be effluent. We all enjoy rural living, uh, market town living. If you start having pig farms and pig rotations up to the edges of towns, uh, and certainly um, I'm sure you're aware that the land up to the bypass is far more valuable for housing uh, that it is pig farming, and, and that's the reality of it. Peter Blaskus. Yes, um, <clears throat> I seem to remember last time you, um, when the um, restaurant trade dived with COVID, you had a contract with Morrison's, I think it was, to supply to the retail um, trade. Have you managed to improve on that, or is that not worth doing? Well, I think, no, no, no. Very well remembered, Peter. That was good stat. Yes, we did a hundred ton for Morrison's, uh, which went into their um, sort of food parcels they delivered at home, and we also did another hundred ton for a charity called Fair Share, uh, which was going into food banks. So I mean, when we were effectively closed in that that January February twenty one, uh, very low ebb, um, you know, it was very valuable work, but. You know, we're not the only bacon company in England and and everybody saw that food service had uh, contracted significantly and the big players um, pivoted and re-engineered their lines. Uh, one of my um, competitors had eight lines similarly to similarly to us, couldn't man one line. One line was broken down. Another line they'd switch from re, uh, sorry, from food service to retail to benefit from extra orders themselves. So we, when we won the, the, the work with the pub chain, that was because people had pushed all their manufacturing capability into retail and then couldn't pick up the food service work was then being offered back to them. So the irony is that we, when we believed in the long-term future of the sector, as it grew back probably 10% a month from the April 20, yes, from April 20, we thought, no, it will come back. There's no reason why, you know, people with cruise ships, they, they might have been in port last year, but they, they want to get them back sailing. I mean, that's 24-7 food, literally. And, and some of the ships started to sail in October last year. But the, the food service sector is coming back. Hotels are not fully back yet. Um, and, and, but the events, it's a full programme of events this year. Uh, we just won some work, about 20 tonne of bacon for the British Grand Prix. So again, if you go there, that, that was a good win for us. Um, so now we, we are, our strap line in the business is committed to food service. And we didn't feel we could pivot all our manufacturing over to retail. So we, we didn't go further with that, but we were offered some work after we started building back again with, um, with Morrison's, but we were just a bit too late to get back to it um, with our contracting of the business. If we'd known in advance, we may not have made so, so many redundancies and cut so hard, um, but we didn't know what was coming in the future. So we had to, you know, react quickly and early.
So I hope that answers it, Peter. Yeah, thank you. Any other questions? Uh, Jim, sorry, I didn't see your hand up, Jim. All right, no problem. Um, hi, Robert, and thank you for, for joining us um, tonight. One um, quick and slightly flippant question. Do you like bacon yourself? Uh, it's a bit of a busman's holiday now. I mean, I, you know, in the modern cat category with walking, exercise, flexitarianism, and we've got to get this in, in, in context. I think we are 6% vegetarian in the UK, 1% flexitarianism. So we are still 93% um, carnivorous. You know, we're, we're meat eaters. We're at our most efficient when we process protein, beef protein particularly, you know, for our own welfare. But no, I've cut back with, with meat uh, in general. I probably eat red meat once a week maximum, mm. uh, you know, if not twice a month. And um, I, I, I went away to Norfolk a couple of weekends ago and I had my first full English cooked breakfast that I'd had in months, but it's not on my daily uh, daily menu. No, I'm more salad and <coughs> that sort of thing, but the irony. Yeah, no, that, that's, um, I think a lot of people have done that and instead of just cutting it out, which is quite dramatic, they've sort of decreased a little bit, which, which is obviously going to have an impact on demand, isn't it? Yeah. Um, what, what I was wondering though, is that you were talking about your structure where um, you bring the, the, um, the bacon in from other countries and then process it, sort it out and then send it back out again. Yes. I mean, I, I might be being a bit naive here and, and not quite understanding how um, multinational organisations work, but how can it be cheaper to bring bacon, to ship it across to the UK, where we still, like you said, have got relatively expensive workers, and then ship it back again, kind of more or less where it's come from? Is that, is that have I understood it wrong? Um... Well, no, there is a cost. I mean, we, you know, the, the, these are these are the mechanics of any market. I mean, at the moment, bringing a lorry in from from Holland, for instance, there's a 700 euro um, fuel surcharge at the moment. So those dynamics are changing. But you know, <coughs> if you gear up gear up farming in the UK. Well, you know, I'm quite happy to boil my pigs over here. Um, but you know they've been doing it for a long time over there. You know some of the, the one of the biggest slaughterhouses I know in Denmark, I think it's on a ninety hectare site, um, yeah. and you you drive to the it's like Stansted Airport. You drive to the middle of it, and the car park in front is, is for cars. The lorries go in the same security gate, and they go to the right hand side of the building. And as you go through the building, there's lines on the floor and numbers on the doors. And they are the number of meters, like office numbers. They are the number of meters that the pig meat has traveled from the right hand side of the building to the left. You know, it's a straight through process. We don't, we don't have these huge uh, facilities in, in the UK. You know, we get local opposition with effluent, waste, smell. Uh, we also have problem with uh, water resources I'm sure you're aware but some of these in, the big uh, super farms are, do have danger of polluting the aquifer and uh, in, in Holland uh, I think there's 17 million people now it used to be 15 million people and 15 million animals in Holland and you know with, with half the country under, under sea level as it was um, if you went to any rural town it absolutely you know, it wasn't just a, a like we've got at the moment, Gordon, thank you very much for a bit of spreading, which we all accommodate. You know, this was all year round. It, it was pungent and, and they got paid to leave uh, and they lost the slaughter capacity. Uh, but it's a well-structured industry in Europe. Um, and we, we, you know, we, we're geared to the supermarket and there's a terrific business called Cranswick. I think I've just reported there annual figures, I haven't seen them, but they were going to report this week. Um, you know, but they're UK farmers, UK pigs, uh, UK processor uh, into UK supermarkets. And they do that very, very well. Uh, but in the food service sector, there isn't the amount of meat 
left after the supermarkets have their sausage rolls and bacon and all the other processing to to get that amount of meat weekly that may have to change then i guess if if um you know if people keep invading other people and all that sort of stuff you touched on the politics of it all um, i mean food security is as important as energy security isn't it well, uh, of course, but, you know, you, you can go back, uh, I don't know when the Brown Blair government was, 25 years ago, is it 15? They, they made some big swerves on structural decisions about investing in, in electricity generation in the UK. We sold all our reactors to electricity to France, EDF. We used to borrow uh, electricity under the Channel Tunnel when historically we would shut down reactors for servicing in the summer when our electricity usage dropped. But because of climate change, we're all on air conditioning now. You go into shops and hotels, we expect to be kept comfortable. So air conditioning has gone up. Um, so we don't have the power drop. We can't turn things off for servicing. The French won't lend us the power anymore. Um, any future investment with, is now you know, funded by the Chinese, by a French company, we're being held to ransom on, on, on power. You know, then you've got Russian gas, is it Thor 1 into Germany? They've bought, built Thor 2 that they're not, never going to use, but they, they're not getting the gas up Thor 1. I mean, just, you know, these big infrastructure product the projects need, need thinking a bit further forward. I think this, I mean, it feels like, a, you know, proper World War Three. Um, you know, if it escalates, you know, we, we should have been thinking about this, you know, decades ago. Uh, and food particularly, yeah, you, know, you know, we outsourced labour was a good point of yours. We've outsourced labour probably for 20 years. Um, I think the first uh, sort of migrant work, workers, sort of uh, Northern European, Portuguese, there was a lot of Portuguese came over um, for a better standard of living. Then it was Poles, it's Romanians. Bulgarians, Hungarians, you know, it, it, it does change. Um, but, the, you know, labour is, is an ongoing issue. But that's got to feed into the inflation. We're also becoming more and more dependent on imports on food, Robert, as you know. I think we're dropping to about 50% in the UK. We, we, we grow 50% or... Oh, that's true, yeah. Buy in 50%. And uh, energy... Is very similar to that. Yeah. Well, you, you know, Gordon, from walking around Hertfordshire recently, that there's only three dairy herds left in the whole county because we counted them. And some of them actually chased you, if I remember rightly. But um, but there's there's only three of them left. Not three cows, but three herds. Yeah. And, um, and that's that's a big change, isn't it? Yeah, but look at milk. Is it milk is a great example, really? I mean, when you had the old milk marketing board, it was uh, it was a way to help farmers get a fair price you know so they can keep producing selling it uh you know, almost cooperatively into the national market when all that's folded up I mean, in the last decade or more um the supermarkets have been using milk as a lost leader mm. so it gets you in to to do your small grocery shop for bread which the baker is right at the back of the store you know, the milk similarly, but you go and pick that up and they were losing three pence a litre, the farmers, uh, on the retail sales in supermarkets. But that was the way the industry was structured. And it, it's sacrilege to see it being tipped down a drain. Surely there's better usage for it than that. You know, cheese production, other, other proteins um, or, or other countries. But, with, uh, you know, just one of the little stats I picked up while I was doing a bit of research Apart from food, when the sanctions came in for um, Russian boat movements, apart from a lot of Russian boats turning off their trackers that disappeared, there was four was it um, yeah four million barrels of the equivalent of four million barrels of oil on boats on the water, out of port, loaded, nowhere to go. So when you, when you stop buying Russian oil. There was four million barrels on its way to China, Turkey, India, that they 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 couldn't control. It sort of, you know, they, the Russians have been clever enough to get it away into the system. But this is why hard sanctions, you know, get breached, don't they? 
Robert, can we just talk, go back to your, uh, your recovery strategy? Um, mm. You've sort of taken a, an unnatural approach and you've increased wages and you increased capital expenditure. Yes. I'm sure many of your competitors did the very opposite to that. I think they did. And have they suffered because of it? Well, I think this is where we've won this, you know, large contract win, uh, Gordon. Um, some of them pivoted away into uh, retail, as we said. Some of them made no investment at all. So now we're almost three years on, aren't we? I mean, we're getting, you know, we'll be, well, maybe two years, two years, two and a bit years, two and a bit years on. You know, everything gets older. I mean, the, the thing of the, the life cycle of cars, for instance, used to be people change their cars every three years. Why? Well, they get older, they wear out, they start costing money to repair. I mean, I've got a different view to that because the greenest thing I can do is keep the old cars I've got rather than create a new one on the planet with a 10 year battery legacy that has got to be charged by electric. We haven't joined up the electric uh, policy of how we generate it. So we, we're going back to cold fire or in fact, uh, nuclear, which although it's the cleanest, leaves the longest legacy. So there's a, there's a lot of stuff uh, about how you invest, but we, we thought our machines were, were aging, uh, technology's moved on, um, and although they weren't, you know, there was different technology controlling the machines, but they fundamentally did the same thing, but in a more modern way. And we thought that was the future uh, rather than sticking with our old processes. So our output has also gone up and we have a more sophisticated product. So in that 30 tonne a week contract win, um, we are slicing a smoked streaky, which is a cured belly of pork, 2.4 millimetres thick for a 20 gram slice to go into you know, burgers and that sort of product as a flavour enhancer. I mean, you often see on a, um, a, a nichoise or a, a Caesar salad, you know, bacon, chicken's pretty bland on its own, uh, you know, in a salad, but it's a Parmesan and the, you know, the oil that you might add and the, and the bacon certainly gives it the flavour uplift. Um, so that's where we've won there by, we didn't go retail, but we, we more niche product more specialised product. So that, that was a good view, vision. Is there bacon in a beef burger, is there? Well, no, no, it's bacon burger. There's a promotion on with McDonald's at the moment. And um, the company, there's two companies that buy for the McDonald's work. And when they're on promotion, they take the whole of their weekly production. They can't keep, it's just massive. Mm -hmm. So I, I don't know if you ever have been on a drive through, but cheese and bacon and uh, goo on top is a is a is a is a value added upsell for them yes i've been dragged along robert yeah i'm sure you have with your grandchildren yes <laughs> right, any other questions for robert oh mary's got a question you can tell mary You're, see that's fantastic she's talking to me now and we can't hear her no, <laughs> I need to get one of these real. <laughs> You're muted, Mary. You're muted. Life was, has just gone back to normal again. Oh, Robert, thank you so much. Thoroughly enjoyed your talk. Hello, Mary. Um, I was hoping we could finish on a cheery note, uh, but that was quite cheery the way you finished. Well, I'm smiling. I, I'm more cheerful. Yes. You in fact, we, uh, look, we, we've got a, um, look, everyone's worked so hard here over this last period. So we're very pleased that um, people are getting well rewarded and yeah. um, thought of. Uh, we're actually going out, uh, we're taking uh, 16 sort of middle managers and senior execs to uh, Smiths of Ongar on Thursday night. Lovely. And, and next Wednesday evening, we've got a party outside the building for everyone employed here for um, a Citroen van full of drinks and um, some, some food being cooked and a bit of music. So uh, just, uh, you know, back from me personally to, the, you know, my, my team and members of staff to say thank you. Wow, so fantastic. We're, 
Yeah, we're we're the happiest organisation, or my organisation is as happy as it's ever been, which I'm, you know, is under my custodianship. I'm quite proud about. So a fantastic legal party. Well, that's not an ego party, but legal, it's just... legal. Legal. Oh, oh, legal. Oh, don't get us on that one. But if we've forgotten all this, we've still got Durham Police to report on Keir Starmer. So, um, it's you know, amazing. Hope... anyway, before we, we've all, we're all missing Panorama. Oh, right. I'm sorry about that. Yes. Anyway, thanks very much, Robert. That's fascinating. And it's to have a local company being so successful um, from really <laughs> get to um, gloom, really. Yes. Right, so just moving forward, um, next month on the 28th of June, we have got Charlie Ireland, who many of you will have seen on television with <laughs> Jeremy Clarkson's uh, farming programme. I think it's Cheerful Charlie, they call him. Um, he's reached um, unbelievable levels of fame, has Charlie Ireland. So anyway, he's coming to talk to us next month about working at Diddley Squat Farm. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Which I think, uh, <laughs> He's very amusing to actually listen to. So, uh, and then uh, the month after that, we've got the leader of Hertfordshire County Council um, talking about what it's like to the lead a council. Uh, and uh, then in October, we have Rowan McKenna, McKellar, who's an Olympic rower, uh, coming to talk to us. So we've got a good, uh, some excellent speakers on, on the on the way. So thanks all for joining us. Could I now invite you all to lift, uh, lift, raise your glasses and toast the Queen and the people of Ukraine? Absolutely. Hear, hear. Yeah. And Ukraine. Okay. Well, thank you all very much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, thank you Robert. Thank you. Thanks, everyone. Cheerio. Bye. Bye. I owe you a pint, Robert. Oh, cheers. <laughs> cheers, Gordon. I'll hold you to that. <laughs> That's fine. <laughs>